Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Before starting, I just want to say a very big thank you to Prof Sherman for inviting me to present here today and to Ms. Haman Hassan and Ms. Lynn Hendricks for attending to all the arrangements that made today possible. And finally, I also want to send out a very big thank you to the amazing young people I've been privileged to work with during the past six years and who've been so willing to share the research journey that I'll be talking about today. Photo Voice has gained immense popularity since Caroline Wang and Marianne Burris first introduced it to us in 1992 as photo novella. With this growing popularity is a growing concern around the rigor in the methods application. As Gubiam and Harper warn us, it is important not to work from the naive perspective that participation is always liberatory. And it is with this in mind that I come to you with today's presentation. If we are to promote the aims of critical theory, post-colonial theory, social justice research, and so forth, we have an ethical imperative as researchers to ensure that the ways in which we engage in research with communities honors their wisdom and expertise. Part of honoring this wisdom and expertise requires us to ensure that we facilitate a critical reflection on structurally embedded experiences and that the knowledge emerging from this reflection is given both a platform from which to be voiced and perhaps more importantly, is amplified in ways that are heard. And so with this in mind, today I will be reviewing the theoretical underpinning of both participatory action research or PAR and photo voice where a focus on PAR is necessary given that photo voice is situated within this broader framework. After reviewing the photo voice process, I will explain thematic analysis and why I think it's a good fit with participatory research approaches, but photo voice in particular. I will then briefly explain the Spaces and Places research program as an example study, which I'll use to walk you through the analysis process and approaches to dissemination. So we begin with the theoretical underpinnings of participatory action research, PAR. There are four essential elements to PAR. Participation by stakeholders in a systematic research process aimed at the advancement of knowledge, and that results in action on the part of stakeholders that leads to social change. A central component of participation is engagement in a democratic process, which translates into research with people at all stages of the project. The key premise is that research should be done with people and not for or on people. That said, in order, in order to participate fully, people need to know and understand how various research methods and processes can facilitate a more complete understanding of socially embedded experiences. The implication for research then is that if you sell short on methods and rigor, you sell short in the value of participation. Simultaneously, however, if the methods process remains inaccessible to the community, full engagement is again not possible. Because of this, we as academics and researchers are obligated to represent research methods, to find ways of ensuring that while the implications the implication of research, the implementation, sorry, of research methods remains rigorous. We work with communities to ensure that these processes are accessible. In short, PAR approaches require the full participation of all parties involved at all stages of the research. Moving on to the research aspect of PAR then, it's critical to realize that because research is situated in PAR it does not mean it's somehow watered down or reduced. It remains an intentional process of knowledge production that results in peer-reviewed outputs. In this way, it is separate from action learning, aimed at solving problems through local understanding. Additionally, it is often the process of data analysis and dissemination at which the intersection of participation and research become murky. While many approaches to participatory research do reflect the successful reworking of data collection approaches, we as researchers sometimes fall short in terms of analysis. Many dissemination projects reflect clearly the data gathering process, but fail to clearly articulate how data was analysed. Equally important are considerations of knowledge mobilisation, the ways in which new knowledge generated through PAR is presented, and to whom it is presented. And finally, action. This is intended to bring about social change. If the action is limited to a public exhibit, for example, it has not necessarily been fully developed. 
it may not reach those stakeholders who hold power over resources and with whom critical dialogue needs to take place. Similarly, an art style exhibition does not necessarily ensure that the intended meaning of community researchers has been adequately communicated to knowledge users. And finally, even if relevant stakeholders are present and messages are clearly communicated, what guarantee is there that these messages will be taken seriously? In order for social change to be initiated, relevant actors will need to be present. Ways will have to be found to ensure that they understand the content of the dissemination approach. And finally, some social players, policymakers, for example, will require that the evidence placed before them is reliable and valid, is scientific. We may object to these terms, but we do need to be cognizant of their existence, positioning, and role in the knowledge to action for change process. This has implications again for the research component. Simultaneously, if we want change to be meaningful, we have to give critical and full consideration to the ways in which participation occurs and the depth of understanding that is achieved in this process. These three components of participation, research and action, are brought together through a collaborative effort of researchers and populations in order to inform a rigorous body of knowledge and related social change, usually within a social justice agenda. And so we can start to see that the ethical, social and research implications of PAR are complex and require great care and skill in their meaningful application. With these foundational co components of PAR in mind, we now turn our attention to the theoretical underpinnings of photo voice. Photo voice builds on the principles of feminist theory, Paolo Freire's critical pedagogy and photography. In order to fully understand the process of photo voice, we have to understand the theory underlying it. In their work with women living in rural farming communities of Yunnan province, China, Wang and Burris sought a means of exploring the apparently trivial or the taken for granted in daily lived experience and uncovering the social and political constructions around these experiences that maintain the status quo of marginalization, oppression, and so forth. Here they drew on the work of Ruth Frankenberg, reviewing the social construction of race and gender amongst white women in the USA. It is especially Frankenberg's conclusion that the private, the daily and the apparently trivial in women's activities come to be understood as shared rather than individual experiences and as socially and politically constructed. That resonates with critical race theory, queer theory and the sociology of childhood, but to name a few. Additionally, they sought a method that was collaborative and inclusive of women that reflected a nothing for us without us approach that resulted in liberation. These sorts of inclusive, reflective and change orientated approaches were of course contained in the work of Paolo Freire. Freire sought to establish an egalitarian power shift in educational process, situating students and teachers as equals colleagues, if you will, where they collaboratively co-created knowledge through a process of collective introspection and dialogue. To do this, he made use of images, photographs, which he believed functioned as a mirror to communities, reflecting everyday social and political realities that impacted and shaped people's lives. Freire believed that through a collective process of reflection, introspection and discussion of photographs, communities would be able to uncover the social and political constructions that maintained their marginalization, and in the case of the communities with which he was working, their exploitation. They were in essence able to achieve critical consciousness of their socio-political positioning. With feminist and critical pedagogy frameworks in mind, we turn our attention to photographs. Why is it that Wang and Burris, and even Freire for that matter, were drawn to the use of images? For several decades now, the argument has been well established that images can serve as signifiers of culture, highlighting values and expectations of individuals as well as groups. This is because images are not unequivocal records of reality. There is little that is literal about the image. Again, for decades, authors have argued that images, including photographs, have no meaning in and of themselves. 
They take up meaning from the contexts in which they are inscribed or which we inscribe to them. How images are created and the sense viewers make of them depends fundamentally upon the cultural assumptions, personal knowledge and the context in which the picture is generated and presented. How images are seen and read is shaped by the values, beliefs, assumptions and experiences that both photographer and viewer bring to them. Essentially, because images are argued to be visual representations of subjective experiences rather than objective statements, the exploration of visual meanings not only helps us see, but asks us to slow down and consider, to think about what it is we're seeing and what it is we don't see and why. In this way, photographs themselves are not so much the data as the research questions. It is the discussion of the images and the reflection on lived experience that they elicit that are the core data. And so it is these collective principles and theories that inform the photo voice process. Explaining the narrative component of this participatory process, Wang and Burris explained the acronym voice in photo voice as voicing our individual and collective experience. Photo voice uses reflective photography then to enable people to record and reflect community strengths and concerns, promote knowledge and critical dialogue about community issues and the impact on individuals through group discussion of images, and reach and inform policymakers to bring about change. And it is these three aspects that make up the three components of the photo voice process. Put differently, the photo voice process entails the production of photographs by participants. Images are then collectively interpreted, where resulting findings and knowledge lead to action. Situated against the larger background of the theory that informs this method, however, we see that the photographs produced by participants themselves become the catalysts of reflective stories in which the meanings and interpretations that emerge are elaborated on by the collective group. Put differently, there is a shared interpretation of personal experiences in which meaning is both embedded and from which meaning is co-constructed. Exploring why images are important, what is going on, why, th why this is, what these images are reflective of, and what can be done about it, participants come to understand the larger social processes and conditions in which these experiences are embedded are better able to highlight what is needed to alter these situations, existing resources and needed resources. This process is often repeated several times, allowing participants to delve deeper into identified issues. In identifying the themes emerging from this data gathering process of co-construction, participants are able to generate theories, new knowledge. Simultaneously, they're able to both identify and understand more critically the issues confronting their community, resources available, and action that can be and needs to be taken. Both the developed knowledge and the awareness of resources become a catalyst for social change that communities can draw on. Thought of in this way, not only is the platform for voice crucial in this process, but so too is ensuring that voices are heard. Reflecting on this process then, we see, that we see that there are three core components to the process of photo voice. Image gathering and early reflection, image analysis and deeper reflection, including analysis and theory generation. And finally, dissemination. The first component of photo voice process generally involves re reaching consensus on the research topic and providing training in photography and research ethics. Training need not focus on how to make artistic images, but should definitely focus on at least the technicalities of how to make images. Following this, participants produce photographs individually or as a group and select those that will shape further discussions. To facilitate group discussion of photographs, Wang and Burris made use of the showed guide as a prompt for the analysis process of component two. What do you see here? What is really happening here? How does this relate to our lives? Why does this concern situational strength exist? How can we become empowered through our new understanding? And what can we do? While many research teams elect not to use these questions in their strict format, the questions do reflect the aspects necessary to get at the dynamics of experiences. 
the social, economic and political contexts that support ideologies and control the resources and strategies necessary to bring about change. As such, researchers can use SHOWED as a guide to facilitate the discussion, moving from the more superficial towards the larger situatedness of the issue under investigation. By integrating these questions into our analysis framework, we can use the analysis process to a understand the deeper structural issues in which experiences are embedded and the processes that maintain or uphold the status quo, and b the actions that can be taken to bring about meaningful change, as well as the resources available to engage in these change processes. While this first research component relates more to the development of knowledge and theory, the second point relates more to dissemination in the action component. The third component of PhotoVoice relates to dissemination. Authors of PhotoVoice projects often write about giving participants voice. While this is an important and central aspect of PhotoVoice, what is less emphasized or perhaps even considered is the extent to which that voice is heard and results in action. Authors such as Lutz, as well as Mitchell, Dalanga and Moletsani in particular, have brought attention to this important concern. In order to better ensure that voice, photo voice projects add to both the knowledge base and contribute to change, these authors suggest considering who the actors necessary to bring about change are, how they can be engaged in the change process, and what information they need to do this. Of course, in order to ensure that the information disseminated is embedded in a rigorous process that has produced rich results, able to withstand scrutiny and questioning, we need to give attention to the analysis process. Because of this, we now turn our attention to the use of thematic analysis, analysis within the photo voice process. Guest McQueen and Amy explain thematic analysis as a rigorous, inductive means of identifying implicit and explicit themes in the data. The model they present is a blend of aspects taken from grounded theory, interpretivism and phenomenology, supporting an applied approach to analysis. In this way, their work aligns with the intent of PhotoVoice to develop knowledge through the generation of themes and related theories. They explain that the primary concern of thematic analysis is with presenting stories and experiences voiced by participants as accurately and as comprehensively as possible. In this way, thematic analysis aligns with the goal of photo voice in amplifying participant voice, reflecting lived experience. And finally, guests and colleagues argue that thematic analysis is good for team research and can be used to study topics other than individual experience. This aspect aligns with the collaborative and collective aspects of photo voice. For these reasons, thematic analysis lends itself to data analysis in photo voice, and as will be shown in a moment, is easily adaptable to participatory settings. Braun and Clark outline six steps to thematic analysis that include familiarization with data, generation, generating initial codes, identifying themes that reflect collection of codes, reviewing data to understand and explain the meaning and dynamics of themes, maintaining rigor through intercoder agreement, and producing the final report. Thought of differently, once we are familiar with the data, we begin coding. Once the coding structure is in place, we identify themes that reflect collections of these codes. We then review the data to understand the dynamics of themes the interrelations between them. This process may or may not result in theory development. Before demonstrating the process in action, I'm going to provide some background to the study that I will use as an example of thematic analysis in a participatory action research setting. Spaces and Places seeks to understand how the social and physical spaces around Indigenous youth in Canada promotes their civic and cultural engagement and how this engagement in turn promotes positive and healthy life outcomes. The study expands on the work of authors such as Lalonde and Chandler, who found that in communities where there are high levels of cultural connection, rates of suicide amongst Indigenous youth are significantly reduced. The study has taken place in three Indigenous communities of Canada, two Inuit communities in Labrador, and one Mi'kmaq community in Nova Scotia. 
The research has taken place separately in each of these three sites. In total, 25 youth have participated in the study and participants were between the ages of 12 and 18 at the time of initial participation. As a component of the study, each youth spent a week engaged in a reflective photography process, making images of their community, places they felt safe and connected, and places they felt unsafe and disconnected. Following individual interviews about their photographs, each youth selected approximately four images to share in the focus group process. The data generated with these images was then analysed using thematic analysis. And so, on to the process. To familiarise all youth with the base data, we began the data analysis session by making analog Facebook pages where youth could provide some information about themselves, their perceptions of their community and their images. These pages were then used throughout the course of the data analysis process as a space where youth could post comments to each other and post updates on thoughts and questions. Once everyone had arrived and set up their Facebook pages and, and connected over a pizza dinner, each youth shared their photos with the rest of the group, explaining what the image was of and why they made it. We then gathered and discussed the images and initial points raised in more detail in a focus group style discussion. Research assistants facilitated this discussion, asking for more explanation on issues. Following focus group discussions of photos, reviewing what we see, we used community mapping exercises to explore in more depth what it, what it is that is actually happening in these images. We began with individual community maps, taking approximately five minutes to map out spaces, and then worked in small groups for approximately 10 minutes. And finally, the full group for a longer and deeper discussion. We used this process to begin digging deeper into why does this concern situational strength exist as well? We used community mapping as maps related to the issue of spaces and places that make youth feel they belong. We used body maps to situate youth in relationships and community spaces, thinking about what a young person needs to be happy and healthy. Groups of youth presented their body maps back to the larger group, followed by the question and answers and larger discussions. In this way, we gave attention to the showed question, how does this relate to our lives? While small and large group discussions were occurring, research assistants captured words, topics and phrases that stood out or repeated themselves. These potential codes were written out on flashcards. Cards were then integrated into a card game where each youth was dealt six cards and asked to sort them in order from most important or relevant to least important or relevant. Working around the table, youth took turns placing cards in groups, positioning them where they felt the cards best belonged. They did this one card at a time. As they positioned their cards, youth explained why they felt it belonged with a particular group. The other youth could then discuss this, resulting in a collective debate of where the code actually belonged and why it belonged there. After placing three cards on the table, youth would pass their cards to the person to their right, and we dealt an additional three cards to each youth. The process repeated itself until we felt we had a fairly robust group of codes. Code groups were then labelled with post-it notes reflecting initial ideas regarding themes. This entire process was repeated periodically throughout the analysis workshop. In order to understand the relationships between themes, we then placed code families and their respective theme labels on large sheets of paper on the floor and used coloured string to discuss the relationships between various groups of codes. Bringing this all together, we were able to generate theory regarding what youth need in order to be happy and healthy. Maintaining rigor through intercoder agreement was achieved through multiple approaches, constant feedback on the Facebook walls, the development of codes as a group, the discussion around the meaning of codes, how they group together, where there are relationships and where there are tensions, all with youth participants at the centre of these activities and the related analysis work. Producing the final report in step six of thematic analysis is akin to the component three in photo voice dissemination. Consideration at this stage then becomes about ensuring that there is actionable uptake of these various final reports or dissemination products. 
Here, the arguments of authors such as Westmore Seuss and False Border become important signposts, reminding us not to impose the exclusionary language of academia and only academic forums in the knowledge mobilization process. We are asked to ensure that knowledge is accessible by creating a space for participants to use the language and communication formats of their context and culture. Simultaneously, we have an ethical responsibility to ensure that we contribute to knowledge and dissemination findings to policymakers in ways that honor participant experiences and that their knowledge will be taken seriously. These concerns align well with the growing focus on knowledge mobilization and addressing the gap between what we know in terms of research findings and what we do in terms of policy and practice. And its underpinning tenets of participatory action research allow research teams to more astutely draw on collective connections and, creative, and creativity to identify knowledge users and means of assessing them and best ways of communicating findings with them. In spaces and places, youth elected to make posters that reflected their pervasive need for culture in their lives and the embodied nature of this culture. They painted murals that drew attention to the importance of including youth in decision-making processes within the community and murals that explain the holistic and integrated components of family, culture, self-esteem and education, together with elders, friends, language and nature in supporting positive youth outcomes. As the Director of Mental Health Services in Eskasoni says, if staff are ever in doubt of what service model they should be following, they can now just walk outside the building and look at the mural. All they need to know is right there. Videos showing and explaining the murals were also created, allowing service providers and youth to share the findings beyond the immediate community. Posters have been distributed throughout communities and service provider offices. The messages contained in the posters have been made more tangible through the use of postcards. Slideshows have also been generated of the posters and are available on the project website. Postcards and website links can be shared, for example, with people in federal government offices by local mental health service providers. These postcards and slideshows have an accompanying two-page report explaining the findings. Additionally, policy and practice informing posters have been produced and shared with other service providers. Youth have presented at various international conferences for service providers and people focused on strengths-based work with youth. To conclude, Youth in the Spaces and Places project have engaged in a process of deep and critical reflection on their positioning in their communities, what they require from their communities to do well, and the ways in which communities can better support them in their cultural engagement. They have done this by utilizing relevant data gathering techniques, engaging in a rigorous data analysis process, and giving focused attention to who needs to hear their findings and how best this can be achieved. Through this process of critical reflection, youth have been able to contribute to our knowledge base on youth and their psychosocial outcomes, and engage in a process of knowledge mobilization aimed at bringing about resource change where necessary, and or amplifying existing supports that are required. Because of this critical application of the photo voice approach, irrespective of the questions posed to these young researchers, they are well positioned to provide astute and rigorous answers that honor their wisdom, knowledge, and efforts. Thank you.